So this is our Hot Summer Reads panel. These are a group of fabulous romance authors. We have with us this evening, Lucy Gilmore, Adriana Herrera, Amelie Howard, Cherise Hodges, and Gina Showalter. And I have loved all of their recent releases. So I'm so excited to get to chat about them and romance in general with them today. Um, all of their books have come out in the last couple of weeks, except Cherise's will be coming out July 27th. So I am going to give a more thorough introduction of each of the authors and let them each talk a little bit about their latest releases. So I'm going to switch us to speaker view so you can see whoever is speaking at the time. So we're going to go in alphabetical order for this portion. So first is Lucy Gilmore. She's a contemporary romance author with a love of puppies, rainbows, and happily ever afters. She began her reading and writing career as an English literature major and ended as a diehard fan of romance in all forms. When she's not rolling around with her two Akitas, she can be found hiking, biking, or with her nose buried in a book. And Rough and Tumble is her latest release. It has everything you could possibly want, including all the puppies, you guys. So I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about it. Okay. So hi, I'm Lucy Gilmore. Um, Rough and Tumble is basically um, a pro football player who falls for the woman who uh, runs the puppy bowl. Um, in my book, it is called the puppy cup because you cannot steal names from the NFL. <laughs> okay. uh, so uh, he is done with football and is looking for a way out. She is a diehard football fan and knows everything about him, but is mortified about it and refuses to let him know that she's kind of obsessed with him. So it's a pretty fun, uh, funny romance that builds from there. Um, and all the puppies come from not just the puppy bowl that she runs, but she's also, um, she fosters puppies at home. So there's a lot of dogs in the book. <laughs> I loved it so much. I laughed and I cried, which I feel like is my benchmark for a fabulous <laughs> contemporary romance. It makes you feel all the feelings. So thank you so much, Lucy. And next we have, oh, where did my bio go? There we go. Adriana Herrera, who was born and raised in the Caribbean, but for the last 15 years has let her job and her spouse take her all over the world. She loves writing stories about people who look and sound like her people, getting unapologetic, happy endings. The book of hers I read was American Fairy Tale, uh, but she also had another release also on the same day. Is that right? On June 29th, One Week to Claim It All came out. So she's going to talk a little bit about that one, but American Fairy Tale was a re-release in trade paperback and it's fabulous, you guys. Hi, yes, so American Fairy Tale is the second book in my Dreamer series, which is my debut series. And it's um, it's a gay romance it's set in New York City. And it's Camilo, who is a social worker. He works in, I work in the domestic violence field, so I write a lot about social workers since it's my job. So he's a social worker and he meets Tom, um, well, he meets a mysterious stranger at a gala and they have a very like super um, steamy encounter. And then lo and behold, um, you know, two days later, Tom is the new big funder for his nonprofit. So things get complicated, but love prevails. Um, and then my other release is One Week to Claim It All, which is my um, Harley Quinn Desire debut. And it's a um, romance um, revolving around the Sambrano family, which is the Dominican family that owns the telenovela studio. And Esmeralda, the heroine, is the illegitimate daughter of Patricio, who's the patriarch, and he, in his will, leaves her the entire thing. And then the only snag is that the current CEO is her ex-lover who broke her heart, and they have to compete for the top position. So... There's a lot of drama, a lot of twists, a lot of telenovela-like situations, um, but also love prevails. So those are my two releases. Thank you, Adriana. And next is Cherise Hodges, who was bitten by the writing bug at an early age and always knew she wanted to be a writer. She wrote her first romance novel, Revelations, after having a vivid dream about the characters. She hopped out of bed at 2 a.m. and started writing. A graduate of Johnson C. Smith University and a winner of the NC Press Association's Community Journal Journalism Award, Cherise lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, where she is a freelance journalist. She loves hearing from her readers, so follow her on Twitter, friend her on Facebook. 
and her upcoming release on July 27th is Open Your Heart. It is a bombshell of a romantic suspense. It just jumps right into the action. I loved it so much. Therese, can you tell us about it? Absolutely. Um, so Open Your Heart is the third book in the Richardson Sisters series. And it follows Yolanda Richardson. She witnesses a murder outside of her boutique in Richmond, Virginia. And she thinks she can handle it herself, but she starts to see threats. So she has a very protective father and a very nosy little sister who end up getting her a bodyguard. And Chuck Morris is like the finest thing going. And as much as he wants to keep things professional, he can't deny his attraction to her, but he knows how dangerous that could be. So what happens do they get caught up in the emotions or do they get killed gotta find out in july july 27th it's not too far away no bye <laughs> it was so good you guys and you definitely want to know how it ends so next is amelie howard she is the best-selling author of the beast of beslick i'm probably saying that wrong one of that's, oh, that's right. <laughs> oh yes, one of oh the Oprah Magazine's twenty four best to read, and the co author of the number one bestsellers in Regency romance and Scottish historical romance, My Rogue, My Ruin, and What a Scout Wants. She has also penned several award winning young adult novels, critically acclaimed by Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, Voya, School Library Journal, and Booklist. Of Indo Caribbean descent, she has written articles on multicultural fiction for the Portland Book Review and Ravishly Magazine. She currently lives in Colorado with her husband and three children. Her newest book is The Princess Stakes. You guys, this is a decadent historical romance. I loved it. I loved that it wasn't the same historical romance story you see all the time. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure, absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so my latest release was the Princess Stakes. I love this cover so much only because uh, it features a, um, a biracial heroine on the cover, which I really love. Um, so it's about an Anglo Indian princess who tries to escape an assassin um, from her home only to find herself on the ship of the boy she once loved and spurned. And he is now a duke. And there's lots of resentment because she dumped him. Um, so they're stuck on this ship because, you know, she snuck on and uh, there's lots of angst and drama, just like Adriana's book. Uh, so much drama. That must be a Caribbean thing. I don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, friends to enemies to lovers, second chances and the only one cabin trope, which I love so much. So. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And then last but not least is Gina Show Walter. She's the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of over 70 books, including the acclaimed Lords of the Underworld series, the Gods of War series, the White Rabbit Chronicles, and the Forest of Good and Evil series. She writes sizzling paranormal romance, heartwarming contemporary romance, and unputdownable young adult novels, and lives in Oklahoma City with her family and menagerie of dogs. <laughs> her latest novel is Heartless. You guys, it is filthy and phenomenal and I <laughs> loved every second of it. Gina you want to tell us a little bit about it? Uh, yes it features a fey king who's just a wee bit unhinged. Um, he lives for vengeance. Um, the, he, that's where he derives all of his pleasure is um, hurting his enemies. He learned at a young age that if you kill them you can't hurt them anymore. So he makes sure they survive so he can do what he loves to do. And then the heroine is a human woman um, at first until she receives a heart transplant. And then she starts developing these wonderful, terrible powers and ends up in his world. And he wants to use her for vengeance. And so um, she's a little bit, she was one of my darker heroines as well. She identified as murder curious. <laughs> So, but um, yeah, I did laugh a lot while I wrote it. And um, so, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I love that it was both really dark and really funny, which I, I think tried is a to, Yes, that it was like one of my darker books, but also one of my lighter books. Like it was a mix of the two. So, okay. 
So I'm going to switch us back to gallery view so we can see everybody. And we're going to do some Q&A. So the first thing, since this is a hot summer reads panel, and I know a lot of romance readers have different heat level preferences. So if you guys had to rank the heat levels of your books, I know where I would kind of rank you guys, but like how spicy do you feel like your books are? Like what's your readership like? And Amelie, Does do you want to Gina show Walter scale? Because I was like, I know, I was like, are we competing with <laughs> Because if we're competing with filthy, because like, if we're going with Gina show Walter, I would have to recalibrate my rating. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it a one to ten or? <laughs> yes, let's do one to ten. Let's ten do one to hot. filthy. One to filthy. Not <laughs> <laughs> I love that word so much. Because <laughs> I would probably give myself for heartless like a seven or eight maybe that feels fair because it's not uh, like straight up erotica right. it's hot but it's not right so guys let's hear your number <laughs> give us your number <laughs> so i i think mine more in terms of movies because i watch a lot of movies so i usually use the movie scale oh yeah um, that's smart um, and I will put mine at a PG-13 sex-wise, like it's there and it's uh, open door, but it's not explicit. Um, but my characters swear constantly. So I think <laughs> according to movie rules, that would be an R for that. Sorry, yeah. mom. <laughs> mine are, I mean, this American Fairy Tale in particular, the first chapter, there's, there's a sex scene. So I would say it's probably, I would say, yeah, like seven, eight, like it's, there's, uh -huh. there's a lot, there's, it's explicit sex and there's a lot of cursing. Um, so yes. I'm a six. A six. I think I'm a six. <laughs> Very good say, number. Yeah, I would say I'm a six or a seven, probably closer to seven. There's like explicit sex and, you know, they're on a ship and they're also in a bar room, he puts her over a table. Yeah, yeah, okay. Or, or like a seven, seven. Oh yeah, the table. <laughs> I have one of those as well. Yeah. <laughs> So what drew you guys to writing romance? You know, for me, romance was just the characters were people that I wanted to hang out with when I was still in my sister's books <laughs> because you always knew that you were getting a happy ending no matter what twists and turns that the story took. So I always thought that these romance authors that I read growing up, like, Brenda Jackson, Rochelle Ellers, like they were so talented because you know from the meeting of the couple that they're going to be together, but you want to read this whole book to find out how they got there. And I think that that's such a talent that romance authors have because everybody knows, okay, hero, heroine, they're going to be together in the end, but how do they get there and how do they stay? So yeah. that's one of the things that drew me in. Um, I think for me, I had, my parents were really strict and I wasn't allowed to date. So I had to date my books <laughs> to go find <laughs> romance in my, my stories that I stole from my grandma, all her Harlequin and Milton Boone's books I stole. I used to hide them behind my textbooks when my mom came into my room, I'd be reading them. I mean, I fell in love with romance from a young age, like stealing her books, probably, you know, I mean, maybe too young, but I was always a voracious reader. Um, and then when I started writing romance, I actually started in young adult, but even my young adult books, uh, romance was a central uh, theme for all of them. Um, I love writing about it. I love writing in the young adult side, uh, love writing about, you know, first loves, first discoveries, um, you know, that whole people talk about insta love, insta lust, insta lust. I love all those things. And then writing for an adult audience, especially in the historical um, era, I really enjoyed writing those um, explicit scenes <laughs> oh god i'm still stuck on the first question i can't get this <laughs> out of my brain <laughs> so for me um my background is literature um so i was a literature major in college and um i kept going back to i would only read bronte or austin or the shakespeare stories with a happy ending and i was like i would only write about those ones and i would only read those ones and i would only bring those ones up in class and then finally somebody like took me aside i was like you know you don't actually like literature you like romance and i was <laughs> like oh that's true and it was just all off course from there i realized that i don't actually like the, the stuffy books i like the ones that end well 
Uh, well, for me, I just, I would steal them from my grandmother's house from, um, and, you know, I was a little boy crazy um, in the teen years. And so here was this sexy man who fell in love and just went, would do anything for this one woman. I mean, his whole life was making her happy. And it was just this incredible dream that I just kept reading and reading and reading. And it, it's so funny because one of the first questions I got after publishing was uh, this guy said, well, aren't all romances the same? And it's like, well, did you fall in love with your wife the same way I fell in love with my husband? No, we all in reality have a different story. And that's the same thing with our books. It's different people, it's different situations and adventures. So I just, enjoyed the journey yeah for me I think it's a place of comfort it's always been a place of comfort for me reading I, I I'm, I'm also like a voracious reader like I read a lot of everything but romance was always that place for me that I went to when I wanted a soft landing and I always knew what I was gonna get and I mean I grew up in the Dominican Republic so I didn't I I read a there was like some Span some romance in Spanish and there were some authors that wrote romance, of course, in Spanish, but I, I would come and visit family here in the, in the States every summer and I had older cousins and one of my cousins who lived in the, lived in the East Coast was a Harlequin person. She had all the categories mm -hmm. and my cousin who lived in the West Coast was a historical romance reader. So she had all the Joanna Lindsay's and like- That's, yeah. Julia Garwood. So then I was like, I would just like <laughs> let's steal all of their books and bring them home with me. So that's how I kind of like discovered the American uh, American romances as a teen. So we're all book thieves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's be honest. I think all book people are book thieves. Like we all stole books from someone at some point and made them our own. Dangerous for a bookstore owner to stay. <laughs> Uh, I know the loss percentages of a small bookstore, so I feel like actually that's pretty sick for me. <laughs> okay, so from a kind of craft perspective, like where do you start? Because I know this is different for everyone and sometimes different for every book. So maybe for the your most recent releases specifically, did you start with one of your main love interests? you like knew who they were and needed a story around them? Did you start knowing what the conflict needed to be and built characters around that? Do you just like start writing and hope it goes well? <laughs> I started this book because it was, it's part of a series and it was the third in the series. I kind of knew where it was going, but I remember talking to my dad and I asked him, I said, um, cause I, have a, I only have one sister. So I asked him, I was like, you know, if somebody wanted to kill Adrian, and that's her name, <laughs> I said, if somebody wanted to kill Adrian, would you pay for her to have a bodyguard? And he said, no, because I'm broke. <laughs> I'm like, but if you knew somebody could protect her, would you make sure that it happened? He was like, of course. I was like, okay, great. And I was like, hmm. So, so if I make my dad rich, if somebody's chasing my sister, he would pay for her to get a bodyguard. And since I'm the youngest, I'm going to be the one to tell him. So it was kind of like that part was easy, but coming up with the bodyguard, like I had to, and I don't like to plot and plan, but I have these friends who have bullied me into it. So I actually <laughs> sat down and like, came, I have a whole notebook where I just developed his character because I was like, he just can't come in and just be the bodyguard and save her and they have sex. Like, he needs a backstory too. <laughs> so that's kind of how I, I did this one. Um, I did a lot more plotting and planning than I normally do because my friends are books. <laughs> <laughs> Adriana? Um, yes, I'm a plot, sir. Like I do do a lot of pre-writing um, and planning, but I throw it out within like the first five chapters. And then I end up like doing like 17 different outlines for the same book. But 
with um fa with fairy tale i actually it was my second book i ever wrote so i outlined a ton and kind of followed that but um for one week to claim it all which is my uh category romance i only had fifty thousand words and categories have like a certain you know a set of things especially the the her desire has to be like really wealthy families and there's like got to be a little bit of like more drama so i was like what's perfect for Latin people in a category, telenovelas. So I kind of went with just kind of like coming up with certain elements that you always show up in a telenovela, like oh, someone crashing into a boardroom or something like that. But um, I always, like my main thing is I always center my books around Afro-Latinx culture and characters. So that's kind of like the core story, just like celebrating characters that have the same background as I do. And kind of, that's where I start from and like generally go from there. So I, I kind of have to figure out where, like how culture fits in, whether it's a business or it's art or something like that. Lucy? Um, so for this one, it was actually my publisher asked specifically for it. So they said they wanted football player, they wanted puppy bowl coordinator, and they wanted a golden retriever. So they gave me those three elements and then just sort of let me loose. And so I put the, those three characters in a room together and just let them go from there. Um, I plot nothing ever. Uh, I just make it up as I go. And it's a terrible method and I don't recommend it to anybody because I rewrite <laughs> constantly. But I usually end up with something I don't hate. So yay. <laughs> Gina? Um, with Heartless, it, I knew it was the first in a new series, and I knew that I wanted to write a heroine who received a heart transplant and, from a fey princess and then began to change, and I knew I wanted her personality to change um, with her clothes, and then with the hero, I knew that he was a fey king, he was unhinged, and he was obsessed with vengeance. Um, I knew I was going to make him my um, darkest hero yet, um, but to write the story, I, I did write the prologue first so I could get to know him, but then I figured out what I wanted the end to be, and then I figured out how to get there. So that was how I got that one. And Amelie? So I think with the princess stakes, normally like I'll have a, a high concept idea, you know, depending on what's being pitched or sold or anything like that. And then you have like, you know, what the first book in that series is. But for the princess stakes, I knew I wanted to write a diverse historical romance um, and I needed to base it on someone that I could do research on, especially during the period. So uh, the Rani of Jhansi, who was a British, uh, sorry, an Indian queen during the British Raj period, um, was someone that I based Sarani's character on. Um, she was, you know, fearless. She rode into battle with an infant strapped to her back, fighting against, you know, the, the British um, uh, uh, people who were uh, invading her princely state. Um, she was a fantastic horsewoman. She was educated. And I love that there's these, especially during the like Victorian era, there were these very strong women in other parts of the world. Um, the other person that I researched was Sophia Duleep Singh, who was a Sikh princess during the same time in the 1870s. She turned as she became a suffragette um, and was also known as Queen Victoria's goddaughter. And, you know, even though she was ranked as a princess, she received so much racism in, in Victoria's court. And I wanted to include a lot of those elements, like the struggles that those women face coming into contact with, um, you know, the British aristocracy. Um, and so that sort of drove the heroine for the princess stakes. And then, you know, I'm supposed to say that all the men in all my novels are my husband. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they're very different men. I'm like, really? He's like, this is me. I'm like, you're wrong. It's not you. <laughs> yeah. So then, I mean, after, you know, I had that idea of where I wanted to take the story, everything else sort of um, fell into play. I've, I've, I started off as a, a, a pantser. Um, and then later on, you know, I learned to plot because you have to do these summaries that you have to turn in. And more often than not, you know, I, I tend to follow them unless a character says, I don't want to have sex in this room. I want to go in this room over here. <laughs> okay, well, you brought up research. 
Um, and I think a thing that gets left out a lot is how much research romance authors have to do, like, because you are setting up whole worlds. And so, Amal, you kind of answered this already, but what is something maybe you didn't expect to research as a romance author that you have ended up having to research? Um, that's a good question because it's a tough one because when you're writing about, um, uh, you know, history, you don't want to sanitize it, but it is also romance. So as a romance writer and also a romance reader, you want to make sure that you have, you know, the romantic elements sort of taking precedence in the book, but I didn't want to do a disservice to the story by ignoring some of the things that were real. So when I did have to do research on some of the, you know, like racism in particular that, you know, Sophia Duleep saying endured at court, um, some of the language was, it was tough to read because, you know, as a biracial brown person myself, you know, I've been through those kinds of microaggressions and microaggressions. So it, it was tough to read, but I had to, at the end of the day, decide what I wanted to include in the story that would make it whole, for lack of a better word, or, you know, as, as fully fleshed out as possible, um, while still making sure that it was, you know, fun to read for the reader. Okay. So balance. I'm gonna pass this baton. Should I just <laughs> hand it out? Okay, I'll go to Adriana, I'll give it to her. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting because I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a historical and the, the level of research really does increase a lot. When you're writing a historical, it's a lot more research, but for the Dreamer series in particular, um, it's uh, for friends. So it's it's a contemporary, but it's it's for friends who are all from the Caribbean. The first hero is Dominican. Camilo is the second hero in American fairy tale. He's um, Cuban Jamaican. So part of what I wanted to do specifically with that group was show some of the different diasporas. Like one of the things that like as a person from the Caribbean, from a specific part of the Caribbean, knowing how big the Caribbean is, that is hardest when people are just like, oh, Caribbean people. Like, it's like, like we're one lump, like we all come like from the same place. And so, you know, it, there's different colonizers, there's different diasporas, there's mixes of cultures oh. within the islands. It was like, it. Was, I mean, the Caribbean in like as a civilization was like being, the modern world was being built. The Caribbean was literally like Grand Central Station. Like everyone was going through it. So um, I wanted to show just like that level, like the intricate diversity. So for fairy tale, Camilo is Cuban Jamaica. And so his mom was a Marielita, which is a particular wave of Cuban immigrants that are refugees that arrived in the 80s um, during the Fidel Castro regime. But it was like a specific like period of time where he like opened the jails and basically said, if people want to leave, they can just leave. And like, like thousands of people got on boats and came to the States. And then his, his, his dad was Jamaican and his, mom, his grandmother came as a nurse in, in, the, in the 60s because a lot of women of color were coming from the Caribbean who had nursing degrees to work at hospitals that were serving people of color. So those are things that, you know, just are reflected sometimes in, in, in romance and in fiction that there's like particular groups of people that come because of certain geopolitical situations in their own countries as well as here. And it kind of just gets all thrown, thrown together. So I wanted to like do some of that in the books. And I mean, I don't get too deeply into it, but at least it's there. I love that nuance. I love that. I love those layers, it's so cool. Yeah, and you do it subtly within the books too, because in fairy tale, when Tom first starts speaking Spanish, Milo mentions that he sounds Dominican, which as a right. not Latinx person might not have occurred to me that there's, they can, you can hear the difference in accent if you're familiar with it. So I love that it was just kind of slid in there in a way that caught my attention, but it, it was still very just in the story. 
you guys have all this rich research and here um, I looked up a little bit about trolls and ogres and, <laughs> and maybe and maybe heart transplant uh, protocol, just how they, what they say when they call, but that's about it. I tend to make things up instead. Well, one of the fun things I think about paranormal is that you're kind of creating your own world so you can <laughs> just mix yes. it up. Yes, yeah. This is my world, these are my rules. Yes, I'm a world builder. Yeah, in contemporaries, I think the big challenge is um, the main thing I have to um, research is careers, because if you get a reader who is familiar with that career and you get it wrong, mm -hmm. like they will tell you every single time. And they're justified because they know it in ways that I cannot possibly. Um, like shows that try to um, talk about, or they show the publishing world and where the company <laughs> bought, just bought the manuscript and a week later it's on the shelf and it's yeah. a New York Times best-selling <laughs> novel. They fly them out for lunch every day in New yes. York. And yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> But I don't really like talking to people or calling people. So I um, lurk on forums a lot to get my information because I think that that's one of the places where people feel free to speak and kind of share their experiences and it's unfiltered. So I find that to be really useful. And if I get your career wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I fall back on the, the whole journalism thing because I ask questions all the time. So if it's, it's something that I don't know and I know somebody that does it or... You know, I'll just go up to a stranger and just start asking questions. And I'm like, yeah, you know, um, I might be writing a piece about this for um, an online magazine, but I might not. It might go on a book, but I don't have to use the real name. So I, people open up to me for whatever reason, whether I want them to or not. <laughs> so it's a, it's a good superpower to have. That is a good one. Okay, so as romance authors, you were, we're all obviously romance readers first, but while you're writing, can you read other romances or do you have to like put that on pause when you're in the writing process? I have to, yeah, I have to read other, other genres. Like I don't write contemporary. So like I gorge myself when, cause you know, if I need to read at night just to relax, that's what I read. But I don't read historical when I'm writing a historical novel at all. I just don't want to subliminally take anything in. And especially some writers, like they have such gorgeous turns of phrase and you're just like, God, they're so good, why? <laughs> and you know, I don't want to get like some performance anxiety. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I, I, I tend to read other, other stuff, like other books. Yeah. Like Gina's, I read her. <laughs> yes, same. I, I'm in pre-writing, I read a lot of the same stuff. So for example, when I was planning my historical, now I was reading like a lot of historical. But now that I'm in like the drafting, well, I wasn't drafting, now in the revision, I usually read some, like I'm reading like a ton of <laughs> like gay romance mysteries right now because it's completely different from one. And I, I've like, if there's a cozy mystery series out there with gay characters and it's a romance, please send them my way because I've run like 20 in the last three weeks. <laughs> That's funny because I write cozy mysteries, not gay ones, unfortunately, in addition to uh, romances. And that's what I do. When I'm writing romance, I read cozy mysteries. And when I'm writing cozy mysteries, I read romance because it is a good palate cleanser. They're close, but they're not close, too close. I just wrote a cozy mystery with... Um, my friend, my best friend, uh, Jill Monroe. So I'm excited about that. It'll come out later this year. Romancing the Gravestone. <laughs> <laughs> Cozy mystery titles are the best. Yeah. That's what I do. I read like, I'll read a thriller or a lot of cozy mysteries and while I'm writing contemporary. And then when I meet my deadline, I catch up on all the books. That's why I go, that's why I went to the bookstore today and bought all the books that I'm going to read when I finish the last Richardson Sisters book. <laughs> so it's, it, it, to me, just reading something different gives you like a clean slate for what you're going to write. Because like um, Amelie said, you don't want to, you know, pick up on somebody else's really great stuff and put it in yours. And then you're like, okay, did I just plagiarize my favorite author? Like what's going on? So you have to kind of set that aside and 
then you know you read it and you think about your manuscript and you're like man nobody's gonna buy my book <laughs> <laughs> is that a thing do you guys read other people's books and like feel bad about your books I have done that yes oh, I think no. it's a rule I think you have to <laughs> that's so sad I feel bad. I think I feel envy if something's really amazing. And I just like, I was telling my husband, I read this book that just came out. I was like, oh my God, this author is like so delicious. Like her just lead up and her intimacy scenes. And I was like, oh, okay. All right. Now I'm inspired, you know, so it can go the other way. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Like, I'm going to do awesome on this book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think there's some people just like you study them. Like there's someone, someone the other day said like there's like authors who are like um, for writers, like writers, writers, like you you read them almost to learn, right? Like to study how they pull that off, and and so like it is it is inspiring in a way because you're like, man, this is like mm -hmm. I see what she did there, I see what he did there, and like I'm gonna try it out. Yeah. Yeah, I think where you are in the process makes a difference. Like if you're in the drafting stage, I think you get a lot of inspiration from other books. But if you're in the, I just had to cut the last third of my book and rewrite it, I think it's harder to capture that joy sometimes. <laughs> it's hard to capture any joy when you've had to cut the last third of your book, I think. But sometimes you have to read a book twice because the first time you read it, you're the reader and you just enjoy it. And then your writer brain kicks in and you go back just like, um, Adriana said, you go back to study how the book was set up in the process and you can kind of unpack the process. And then you're like, well, maybe I'm going to try this on my next book and see how I can do it. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's inspiring. And it's like, man, I wish I could have done that. <laughs> like, I think about Gone Girl a lot. That book was so much better than the movie. <laughs> and I, was, I don't even like to read really, really long books like that, but I read that book in a day and a half. And I was like, man, if I could have thought of something like this, but how would you turn this into a romance, crazy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a happy ever after in that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, did my first judging a contest this year where they had a really extensive rubric. And I sort of thought that maybe that's how authors read because it made me really read kind of critically, which was interesting and I enjoyed it in a way, but it also made the whole reading experience just a little less fun because I wasn't just reading for fun. It was like, okay, how did they do on this particular craft thing and this particular craft thing? And it takes you out. When you can so. find an author who um, makes you forget that you're mm -hmm. an author, um, you it's just, it's a really wonderful um, experience. <laughs> okay, so someone earlier mentioned the flying out to New York for lunches all the time and ending up on the New York Times bestseller list a week after they. So I'm not sure if all of our readers really know what the publishing process looks like. And I know sometimes as authors, you guys get like, why don't you write faster? Like it's all your fault. So do you ladies maybe want to talk a little bit about what the actual publishing process is like? Slow. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are so many moving parts to it because you, you've got the idea. So you sit down and you write your first draft and then you, maybe you go over it again. Maybe you rewrite it. Then you send it to your editor. Then she tells you what is horrible about it and everything you need to change. So you do that. Then it goes back to her. Then she tells you what else you've done wrong. And then you go over that. And so you've done, then it goes to a copy editor and it goes through a line edit and then it goes through for time. So you're constantly, somebody is looking at it at every stage. And so it, it, has, it has taken time. Yeah. And, and it's really different if you're hybrid or, I mean, if you're indie as opposed to traditionally published, like I'm hybrid. So I, I put out my own stuff and then I also have my traditionally published stuff. The timeline there is very different and the control you have over your product is very different with indie. Like with indie, I have the idea, I write it, I get an editor, I get a proofreader, I get a copywriter, I get a cover designer, and boom, it's on KU or it's on Amazon. And it's like, it's been five months, but with um, 
publishing, you have the idea, you talk to your agent, then you write a proposal, then you realize you have to write a book after you pitch something <laughs> high concept that you thought was a really great idea. And it's been a year and a half. And then that's that's when the actual book comes out. So the timelines are, are really different. And like, I actually, I live in New York City. So I have the advantage that I can like have lunch with an editor or have lunch with an agent, but it's very different when you are elsewhere in the country where the publishing industry isn't there. So it's also like, like the content, like those movies where like your agent brings you like your galley, like that never happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, all this, I've been in this business a long time and that is now, I, nobody has ever brought me <laughs> my galley yeah. or my- and My editor is driving distance from me and she still <laughs> would never bring me my galley. <laughs> <laughs> And that's not even factoring the first part of getting an agent. Like even mm. before you write the book, if you want to sell to traditional publishing, usually you need an agent. And that can take anything from like a week to like a year. So that's a year plus the year and a half that Adriana just spoke about. That's two and a half years before you see your book on a shelf. I don't mean to sound depressed. <laughs> it's not, but Lucy was right, it's slow and you know, yeah, it's, it's not magic. And then if, if something happens in your life, you know, it's like now books are getting pushed back because I just recently lost my father. So oh, I had, to, I couldn't write because that was like my best friend. So it's like, yeah, um, this deadline's not going to work. I'm sorry. And, you know, so now the book has been pushed back, um, you know, like I think a year and you know, it's just, we're human too. Like we yeah. have all these ideas and everything, but life still happens. The industry moves at a certain pace, but you know, it, it's it's really slow and then it speeds up and then you sometimes have to slow it down again. So it's, it's weird. And then when you're in North Carolina and your airport um, keeps canceling flights, you can't even fly to New York and explain yourself. <laughs> Okay, so you guys all either just had books out or are about to, uh, but what are you working on now or what do you have coming next? Because I know sometimes you can't talk about projects that don't have dates yet, but what is next from each of you? Um, I'm starting something new, but I'm not gonna talk about it yet, but I, I'm in love with it. It's wonderful. I'm super, super excited about it. And, um, but what's I'm um, gonna publish next is the um, romantic cozy mystery I wrote with Jill Monroe, Romancing the Gravestone. Um, we're so excited about it. We had so much fun uh, writing together. We have a similar sense of humor. So um, we've got to play with a lot of things um, and just have tons of fun. And there will be a next book to Heartless coming, right? There, um, there, so there were two in the contract okay. and then, um, and then in December I have releasing, um, the darkest destiny, which is, um, Viola's story. She's the keeper of narcissism. So, um, she was quite a character, um, to write about. Amelie? Um, so I have the second book in the um, in this multicultural historical romance series coming out in October. Uh, that's Rules for Heiresses, um, and it features a West Indian duke. Uh, I have the cover somewhere over here. It's so hot. Um, and then I'm also working on, uh, so I, I signed a series with Grand Central Forever that the first book comes out next summer, and it's based on rom-com 90s movies. So the first one is sort of a riff on Pretty Woman, except there's not a, like, a, she's a ballerina, a French ballerina, instead of a woman selling sex. Um, she's desperate for, um, uh, you know, to make some money because she can't get a job anywhere in uh, France or in England. And then, of course, she makes a scandalous um, proposal with a very straight-laced duke. So that comes out next summer. Nice. Lucy? Um, so I'm finishing up writing a mystery. It's the second one in a series that will start next year. 
um, speaking of the slow timeline. Um, and then uh, my next book that's coming out is a uh, rom-com um, that's one of the trades with the cartoon covers that are all the rage. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and it's about a grumpy dog show judge um, and a former beauty pageant queen who's determined to show a really terrible, fat, lazy dog and make him win. That's <laughs> called I Hate You More. It's a lot of fun. Therese? So I'm finishing up the last book in the Richardson series, um, Can't Hide Love, and it's coming out next summer. And um, then I have a secret project that I'm working on that I'm really excited about that's not a romance, but mm -hmm. it's just, I'm just so glad that I'm getting back into being able to write it. So I'm really excited. And Adriana? Um, and so I have, I'm, I'm, what I'm working on right now is the first book in this historical series um, that's coming out next year with HQN. It's um, set at the 1889 Paris World's Fair and the heroines are three Afro-Latina women. The first one is called A Caribbean Heiress's Guide to Paris. And it's about a rum heiress who meets a whiskey distiller who is an Earl and all kinds of things happen. They road trip, they get married in Gretna Green, then they go to Scotland. It's really fun. And um, then I have later this year in October, I have the second book in the Sombrano Studios series coming out and it's called Just for the Holidays. It's a casting director, it's a Latin Latinx actor and they get snowed in in the Hamptons as people do. <laughs> nice. I found this cover. Look at it. It's so pretty. Look at how oh, hot this thing so is, man. Yeah. Oh my God. Look it's so that. I know, right? I was like, hello. <laughs> Looking at her like. It's the hand around the waist. I don't know. His hands are so huge and it's like just around there. And he's like, I got you. I like it. Yeah, it's like the thing uh, Roman's authors can talk about for hours hand placement. Oh. Yes. Yes. Forearm <laughs> veins. I will, hello. I always forget which author it was, but one of our local authors, Carolyn Sparks, had done a panel with another author who, at the event they were doing, realized that there was a third arm on the hero on her cover. Nice. So, arm placement's important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so do you guys have any upcoming books you're excited to read? Well, I fell into the Murderbot trap. So everybody on Twitter was talking about Murderbot and I was like, what is this? I picked the first one up, they're amazing. So I'm like deep in that, it's a long series so I've got a ways to go, but the, what everyone says is true, it's amazing. Uh, I am so looking forward to finishing this book so that I can read Alan Queen by, by um, mm -hmm. Vanessa Riley. So that, that was one of the books that I picked up today. And um, then I'm going to read Low Country Bride. And then I'm going to read all the Harlequins that I missed <laughs> for the last two months. So yeah, um, the, the rest of the summer is going to be a hot reading summer. Can't do the hot girl thing because I don't have the Meg knees anymore. <laughs> Um, J.R. Ward has a new book coming out, Claimed, so that's always exciting. Um, but I've been, I was um, in a deadline, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what else is coming out right now. I'm, draw, I'm drawing a blank on it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm secretly looking on my iPad right now to see like all of this stuff that I have on here. That's like- well, Island Queen is the one I was gonna say. Yeah. It just came by Vanessa Riley, just mm -hmm. came out today. And I'm looking forward to listening to that one. Oh, and Jill Monroe had a book that came out today. My, one of my, I mean, my writing partner. That's always a great day. How do you guys as authors celebrate release days if you don't have a launch? Like, like you do, right? You celebrate when you have a book out, right? Or do you like I haven't in a review? very long time. I've worked on the day of release. I've been working on a different book. 
So that's been for years now. I usually make everybody in my house wait on me hand and foot and <laughs> bring me breakfast. I like that. I, I like, like that. lie around. I'm like, mommy has worked so hard. This book is out. Go get me some vino. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, like Gina, it's kind of like, you know, you just, I, I also work, you know, you have launch stuff planned. Um, I do try to do something special for myself, which is like, you know, whether that's like, I mean, I haven't gotten a mani-pedi in a year and a half. So I have like Sasquatch feet, but um, you know, something like that, or like a dinner out or a lunch out or something, just, you know, just to say, good job. It's out. Cause after it's out, it's not yours anymore, which is kind of like the hardest piece, right? You just let it go. I'm better at celebrating, um, when I finish the book. Cause to me, that's a more exciting time cause it's finally over. And so I'll do like <laughs> a nice dinner or something then. Cause I'm way more excited to be done with the project than I am for it coming out. <laughs> So when you finish, like it's signed off on, you don't have to touch it anymore. Or when you finish the draft and submit. When I finish it and send it to my editor and then I don't have to think about it till they send it back to me. In a okay. I waste a, a tank of gas and drive around town to all the bookstores, <laughs> see the book on the shelf and take pictures and post it to social media. Then I come That's home. That's so and sweet though. <laughs> I bet that is loved by your readers. Yeah. I, I, I loved it. It's, I've done it since the first, my first book that got national distribution was in 2006. Just can't get enough. So the first time that I saw that book, like, you know, I my first books were with a small publisher. So you would go to like certain Barnes and Nobles or certain um, Borders. That's how long ago it was. You would see it there, but you wouldn't see it like in Walmart, Target, and things like that. So the first time I saw my book in Walmart, I actually screamed in the aisle and the worker was like, what's going on? And I was like, I wrote this book and they let me sign it. So I used to go around and sign the books, but then I hurt my left hand. So now I can't sign books. So it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I still go and you know, and I'll take pictures of my books and then, you know, my writer friend's books are there and it's like, look, we're all hanging out together, even though we haven't seen each other in a year. Yeah, it's somebody you've like talked to three times on Twitter. You're like, that's my friend. I know them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, 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 it depends. Like, it depends if I feel like I have energy to live that day. Cause if it's like a day that it's a book release, but also like, I'm like working on edits or drafting, I'm like, listen, just buy me a bottle of champagne and I'll have it when I'm done with this book. So it depends. It depends like if my, like how my schedule is, like if I feel like I can take a day. Well, I had a massage. I had a massage with this one. That was a good one. That was a good you, you will be my inspiration next time. I'm like, I, well, I'm going to do what Amelie would do. <laughs> yeah, it's like if you have a baby, it's just a book baby. It's like, come on, I need special treatment. <laughs> yeah, but the day you have a baby, you just take a nap. Well, yeah, <laughs> all three of my kids were like, rough. like it was, those were, they were traumatic. But like, yeah, sleeping, I yeah. like that. Rest. Yeah. That sounds really good. I actually, uh, my bedtime is usually, it has been around 8.30 lately. So I, I'm like up 30 minutes past my bedtime right now. <laughs> Same. Mine is like nine, nine Eastern time. So I'm like an hour past my bedtime. That's how much oh, I have yeah. days. <laughs> well, thank you ladies for staying up late with us. Yes. Okay. And then the last thing I always like to ask is, do you have any advice for prospective writers? Because often some of our attendees are also hoping to publish one day. So just like little concise advice. Do you have anything quick that you would recommend to someone? Most often my writing? advice is to treat your writing like a business if that's what you want it to be. Write when you don't want to because you'll have to anyways when you're on deadline. So just write. Okay. Mine is never give up, never surrender. It's from <laughs> Galaxy Quest. Yes. Uh, and, and, and then the other thing is like, never let anyone tell you that you're not good enough. Never. Because that can seep in and, and you are, you have a story to tell, tell it. Yeah. No one else can tell your story. So write 
what you want to write and just be authentic in your writing and you you'll get where you want to be watch lots of tv and movies is mine i think that's where i get a lot of uh, great ideas for dialogue that's where you can learn banter um is when you watch something that's really witty and fast back and forth um because in real life that's almost never there but it's great to read about and it's great to watch yeah i I'd, I'd say like if you can connect with other people that are like at the same stage that you are and possibly other people that are like maybe a little further ahead of you and like cultivate those friendships because they can be really helpful. I know for me in my writing journey, people that I started at my same place, like we've grown together and it's been, and, and people who were further along helped me a lot, figure how to do like the querying thing, the Asian thing. So it's like community is really valuable for creative, like creative communities, like for all people that are creative, having a community that are of people that are kind of like in the same thing you are as helpful. Awesome. Well, thank you ladies all so much. This was fabulous. I always love talking romance. Uh, not a writer at all. I tried it for a little bit once. I was terrible, but I am a voracious <laughs> romance reader. Um, I always love having an excuse to read more. So these panels give me one. So thank you all so much. I loved all your books. Um, participants, they are all available in store, except Teresa's will be in on July 27th. We've got it on order. We'll have it on release date. It's just not out yet, but it will be here on release date. So thank you attendees for coming. Thank you authors for joining us, even past your bedtime. I always look <laughs> at Eastern time. It's real late with the time that we have our events. So thank you all. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.